Thanks for tuning in to the Mariners' virtual baseball bash. Now, enjoy this virtual clubhouse chat. Hi, everybody, and welcome to a very special Mariners celebration of one of the greatest seasons in Major League history. Today, we're going to turn back the clock to the 2001 season, a year in which the Seattle Mariners won a Major League record 116 games. This year marks the 20th anniversary of that record-breaking season, and today we have a chance to visit with three of the ballplayers who played a vital role in that record run. Hi, everybody. I'm Rick Riz. In 2001, Hall of Fame GM Pat Gillow put together a machine-like winning team for future Hall of Famer Lou Pinella to manage. It was a team that added the very first position player from Japan, Ichiro Suzuki, and what a debut that he had. It was a team that led the American League in hitting and run scored, pitching and defense. And right now, we're proud to welcome back some of the key members of that unforgettable team. This is going to be fun, folks. Today, we're going to visit with a pitcher who laughed at father time. And at the age of 38 that season, won 20 games in 2001, Jamie Moyer. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing great, Rick. Looking forward to it. Oh, this is going to be a blast. Great to have you here. Also joining us today is a guy who played all over the field. Don't call him a utility player. He was a player that played all over the field. <laughs> Seven different positions. He reminded me that right away. And he was in the lineup every day, and he had a great year. Mark McLemore. How you doing, Mac? I'm good, Riz. Good to see you. Good to see everybody on the line. There he is, Mark McLemore. <laughs> and also Arthur Rose. So I'm going to be asking the question. No, our next guest was a member of the baseball <laughs> band the Mariners ever assembled, Arthur Lee Rhodes. Arthur appeared in 71 games in that 2001 season. He went 8-0, and and he had a minuscule 1.72 ERA. How you doing, Arthur Lee? What's up, Rizzy? How you doing, buddy? How's everybody uh, doing over there? Oh, we're doing great. It's great to have all you guys. We've already visited with Danny Wilson and Mike Cameron and Brett Boone, Tom Lampkin, Aaron Seeley, and Norm Charlton. We're going to have a great time, folks, with these guys. I'm going to ask now our special guests some questions. And you can also join in on the conversation by going to the Q&A function at the bottom of your window. We're going to get to your questions as soon as we can. So right now, start asking away and get your questions in. Guys, it's great to have you back to relive your record-breaking 2001 season. A question for all of you right now, can you believe, can you believe it's been 20 years since you had that kind of a remarkable year? Jamie? You know, I, it, it, it's amazing to, to think that it was 20 years ago. You said it earlier when we were talking off air, and I just, I can't imagine where 20 years have gone. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the memories that I have of, the team, the way we played, the fan base, you know, being in, in and then so Safeco Field, uh, you know, it, it just, it was a magical, magical season with a magical group of guys. Arthur Lee, could you believe it's been 20? Man, that 20 years went by fast, man. And I can't believe it. Like Jamie said, man, it, it started from the top, Pat Gillick, then it went down to Lou, then the coaches, then in, in our clubhouse, that's, when we were stepped in that clubhouse, it was all our, it was all family. And so I think, and everybody went out there and did their job. And, and so it was great, man. Mark, you and uh, Arthur Lee and Jimmy haven't changed the bit. Can you believe it's been 20 years? <laughs> uh, I can't believe it's been 20 years, but that is a lie. I know I've changed a ton. Uh, I probably Me weigh too. about a ton. But man, I mean, if you look at it, the three of us, I probably played the least amount of time. Between the three of us, I know Jamie's over 20, Arthur's over 20, and I played 19. It seems as though the time that we played went a lot yeah. slower than since the time we've all retired. So, man, it's just gone by so quickly. Yeah, it really has. Let's, let's go back to spring training of 2001. Randy Johnson had been traded away, Junior traded away, Alex Rodriguez left as, as a free agent. And here comes a little guy over from Japan. Brett Boone has added the ball club. And you talked about Pat Gillick adding to that roster as well the previous year with Sealy and Javier. What, what did you guys see at spring training in 2001 before your remarkable run got underway? Jamie, we'll start with you. You know, it's funny you say that because I, I can remember being at a game and I believe I was in Tucson and we were not playing well that particular day, nor had we been playing very well during spring training. 
And I can remember Lou going on a tirade in the dugout, <laughs> something like to the effect that, hey, guys, let's go. We got to turn this on. You know, we're a better club than we are. We can't just flip the switch when the season starts and blah, 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 blah. blah. He was raving and raving like we all know he could, right? And, you know, we get to back to Seattle, that bell rings, and the rest is history. So, but, yeah, that that's one of the, the funny memories that I have of spring training. And looking back on it, I can say it's funny because we won 116 games. Lou, relax, we got it. <laughs> you know, every day we do an interview with Lou before the ball game, and Dave Niehaus asked him the question, Lou, who's the best team in the American League West this year? And he said – the Texas Rangers. <laughs> so, so Kevin Kremen, bless Lou's heart, Kevin Kremen edited that out of the interview. It never was heard. You know? and, <laughs> but, Mark, you guys start the year 20 and 5. And what did you guys realize after the end of April? You won, That was a major league record, 20, 20 wins for the month of April. What did you see? Well, I know going into spring training, I didn't see a 116-win season. Uh, I don't think anybody no. did. I, I think that we all felt that we we had a good chance to get to postseason, win the division, and go deep into the playoffs because we played pretty well the year before uh, and got to, in 2000 and got to you know postseason. So we felt we could do at least that again. Uh, but 116, no. Uh, and even after that first month, we've all been on teams at some point that got out of the gate quickly. So I don't think anybody was even thinking in April, hey, we're going to continue this for the next five months. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, getting out of the gate that quickly, that was that was really a good thing, obviously, because Oakland ended up, I mean, yeah. far behind us, but not that far in a normal year. So uh, it wasn't one of those things where, hey, we knew we were going to get 100 wins or 116 <laughs> for sure. No. No, that's amazing. Arthur? Uh, in the bullpen, Kazuro Sasaki that year had 45 saves, but you and Jeff Nelson and Norm Charlton, Jose Paniagua, and the other guys down in the pen made sure that he was handed a lead. What was it like for you to be a part of, of that bullpen? And what made you guys so great? Man, I'll tell you that. Our bullpen was awesome, man, because each other guy did their job. If I go pitch two days, then Norm go out there and pitch two days. Then Jeff Nelson go out there and pitch. He go out there and pitch. And somebody else. And everybody had their role, man. Everybody picked each other, everybody back up. And I think that's why our bullpen was awesome. And we just had a blast. And, and we always joked around. We always beat up Matt Sinatra in the bullpen. We always <laughs> made the on fire. And so I think we we had, we had a good time. We was out there having fun in our bullpen. And I think that's why we won 116 games and everybody is tripping to do that. Man, you guys had a blast all along the way. I'm glad you mentioned Matty Sinatra. Talk about having fun. That guy, uh, I'm, sure he, I'm sure he got on you guys and you guys got on him. Wow. That must have been fun down to the bullpen. Jamie, looking at that starting rotation, it was uh, you. You won 20 games that year. Freddie Garcia, Aaron Seeley won 15. Paul Abbott won 17 games that year. Brett Tomko, John Halama. How great was that starting rotation? What was it like to be a part of that group that season, well, Jamie? Again, we, you know, we had a, a lot of guys. You know, Freddie was a younger guy. John Halama was a younger guy. But, you know, Paul Abbott, I hate to use the word journeyman because he was he was more than a journeyman. But I think yeah. in the baseball world, he was looked at as a journeyman. Yeah. But I'll tell you what, Paul brought a lot to the club. Everybody, actually, everybody brought a lot to that club. But I think – you know, there was a lot of professionalism with that starting rotation. And there was a, a, a very workmanlike ethic and attitude with that group. But I think not only did the starting rotation and the bullpen and the position, we all fed off of each other's energy. Yeah. And we, we really, I believe as a team, we started feeding off the success that we were having. And if there was any doubt in the beginning of the season, like I said, spring training, there's a ton of doubt. But as we went into the season, that that attitude of winning was almost, you know, I hate to say it wasn't expected in April and it may not have been expected in May. But I think as we started to go through the season, we started to expect it. And, you know, I, I can remember a lot of game or, you know, several games where we might be behind as we were getting deeper into the game. Mm -hmm. And you just kind of got the impression the offense was like, ah, 
we're three runs down in the eighth inning. Uh, we need four. Let's go get it. And yeah. that's exactly what we did. And it was just it, – it became kind of who we were. And if we were ahead, we, you know, there was no panic that, oh, my gosh, you know, we're, our bullpen's not sharp or, you know, we've got guys that are tired. Everybody just picked each other up. And we, I, I really believe we fed off of the energy that was created in that clubhouse. No, you really did. The 20 wins in April, then you won 20 again in May, and then you you had an off uh, June. You only won 19 games in June. Slacking. You know, so you know, Slacking. Slack Mark McLemore, talking about uh, a work ethic, uh, like I said, seven different positions, and you were just all over the place, and you played very well all over the place. What was it like, you know, coming to the ballpark? You knew you were going to be in the lineup, but you didn't know – what position we play that day and probably probably didn't matter. What was that like for you? It really didn't matter to me. I, I, I really enjoyed it because I was, I think I might've been 35 or 36 at the time. So playing those different positions, you didn't have young guys that were doing that. Um, there were only a couple of guys back then that were, that were actually doing it. I think Tony Phillips and I think Tony was retired by then. So yeah. I might've been the only one doing it at the time, but being at that age and being asked to play those different positions, I absolutely loved it because I know most people didn't think that I'd be able to. Uh, I knew I would be able to, but um, I, I, I just loved it. Coming to the park every day, I'm in there. It just depends on, okay, where am I going to be? And that didn't necessarily mean that I was going to stay there during the game. I right. may start at third base and end up in left or start in left and end up at short. Yeah. Uh, it just really didn't matter to me. I just wanted to be in the lineup every day and uh, be a cog in that, uh, in that incredible, incredible team that we had. Really you were a were. young kid at 35. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you look that out guy there, there now, was man. 38, man. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you look out there now, there's nobody out there that's 35. <laughs> so, I'll take it. <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right. I want to have some more fun here. This is a great guy. I love you guys. This is, this is fantastic. We got about another half hour or so to go. And, and fans, we're going to get to your questions in a moment. But I want to talk about Lou Pinello. I want to ask each and every one of you guys, what was it like playing for Lou that season? And and do, does each and every one of you, I'm sure you have one, have a funny or great Lou story that kind of really encompasses what you guys did that year? Jamie, we'll, we'll start off uh, with the veteran here. What was it like playing for Lou? I don't know if we have enough time to talk about Lou Pinella today. <laughs> we all could talk about Lou Pinella for hours. Yeah. But, you know, my time with Lou, uh, I'm for, I'm going to tell you first and foremost, you know, I had the good fortune to play a long, my career was quite long, but Lou Pinello was the, my most favorite manager I played for uh, in my career. And reasons being, you know, first of all, he was passionate and he was passionate to win. He was, mm -hmm. he had a unique way of getting guys to come together. Yeah. You know, some people might say he had a temper. He had this, he had that. He always knew what was going on. He knew he knew his personnel. Uh, he communicated to the best of his ability to his personnel. I love that he was bilingual. He could uh, speak to yeah. his Latin players in Spanish. He could yeah. get to their level. He could, you know, regardless of who it was, he could get to your level. He could challenge you. He could be angry with you. But you know what? As soon as his anger was over, he could put his arm around you. You could be mm -hmm. best friends. I had yeah. trust in him. And, you know, I, I just, his passion helped me. And I, I, I tell people, you know, playing for Lou Pinella was like having another player on the team. Yeah. You know, he didn't really play the game, but the way he managed the game, he managed it aggressively. He managed it smartly. He, he utilized his personnel and he got the most out of us players. And, you know, to me, you know, from the fan base, if you're watching the team, you want to know that that's happening from your management or your coaching staff all the way down through all your players. Awesome. Arthur, how about you? Oh, man, I, I had a blast with Lou, man. He uh, he wore me out in that 116 games because he <laughs> put me out there every day. <laughs> yes, but, uh, over 70 appearances. Yeah, but uh, it was it was great playing for Lou, man. He was an uh, awesome manager. And uh, like you said, he – he didn't give me no days off, but I told him, that's all right. You want to win, I'm I'm out there for you. But that's he was awesome. great, man. I don't I don't have I'm not like Jamie. I don't have a story like that because Jamie was sitting on the bench with him. 
and talking to him. But, <laughs> but uh, he was he was yeah. awesome. Man. He was great. Yeah. Man, uh, there's no question. I, I I've got a million of them. I, I've got a yeah. million of them. I I love playing for Lou. I think everybody uh, that was there uh, enjoyed playing for Lou. Jamie talked about his passion. Talked about his anger. Uh, talk about his knowledge of the game. All of those things come into play. And I, I, I've got to tell this quick story. Sure. Uh, it, it wasn't 2001. It might have been 2000. We weren't playing particularly well. Uh, I wasn't swinging the bat well. Uh, and it must have been maybe only one of two slumps that Edgar was in in his whole career. <laughs> he wasn't swinging the bat well. Uh, Bone wasn't swinging the bat well. And Mike Cameron wasn't swinging the bat well. So we weren't playing well at the time. Yeah. Lou came out, we're stretching, and the four of us are sitting together. And he pointed at Cam. He said, Cam, you've got the day off. Uh, Bone, you've got the day off. Edgar, you've got the day off. And Mac, if I had anybody else to play second base, you'd have the day off too. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> and we just – nobody could say anything. We just fell out laughing, and then we turned around and started playing better for whatever reason. But yeah. I think if you ask anybody from that 2001 team, that if Lou Pinella called oh. right now and said, hey, I need you guys to suit up and let's go play, uh, I think everybody would put that uniform on, even if, oh. even, no matter how bad we would look at them, <laughs> we'd go out <laughs> and talk <with> them. <laughs> That is awesome. Um, um, I, you know, I spent 10 years with them, and uh, I, I love the man. Jamie, you talked about how, you know, he didn't play the game, but man, he played out the game before the game even started at three o'clock. I'd go in there, get ready for my manager's interview with Lou and Mac would come in. Uh, John McLaren is a uh, bench coach. Oh man, I got to turn off my phone. Oh, <laughs> messing up the interview. Oh, oh, oh man, sorry about that. So, That's going to cost you. Sitting there. <laughs> That's going to cost you. That's a fine. <laughs> so Mac would come in. I go, Lou, do you want me to leave? He said, no, 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 stay, stay right there. And he would map out when, as Mac put the lineup together, wherever you were in the lineup, Mark, or, or you guys, if you were starting or when you were going to come in, he mapped out the whole game from the seventh inning on. And he made me a better broadcaster because I knew what was going to happen. He said, oh, we'll, we'll do this in the eighth. And we'll, we'll pitch it for down here and we'll do this and we're going to we'll do that. And sure enough, it did it. it. He did it. And it happened because – you guys were able to make it happen, and it was just amazing. I go, man, I just lived out this game tonight at 3 o'clock in the afternoon because he was he was that good. And we got a million stories about Lupinella. Right now, yeah. guys, let's go to uh, the fans, and let's see what uh, questions the fans have for you because I got a lot more here. We got so much more to talk about, you know, the way you, the, you guys clinched after 9-11. Uh, so let's let's go to the fans and see if we have any questions. Uh, by anybody right here and if not man i'm gonna start asking some more questions so uh do we have any more questions do we have any questions by the fans for mark or jamie or arthur we'll we'll wait for those questions that come in jamie the year before you won 13 games you had a good year in 2001 you won 20 games what was the biggest difference for you in that 2001 season Oh, well, you know, I, you know, when it comes to pitching, it's for me, it's all about consistency, uh, you know, being more consistent, you know, being able to uh, make quality pitches, things like that. But, you know, my with my style of pitching in my career, I really had to rely on my defense. And I and I really felt comfortable with the defense behind me. Um, you know, we had guys at all positions. It didn't matter who played where you as a pitcher, you felt very confident when you took the mound that plays were going to be made behind you. And then, you know, obviously the goal is to get the team off the field on the bench so we could, you know, swing the bats and do the damage. And, you know, as we went through that 2001 season, we did a lot of damage. So, uh, you know, it, it's just, it's the consistency. Uh, you know, you have to put in the work. Uh, for me, it was putting in the work the four days between starts, but being prepared for that fifth day. And I kind of likened it to my, uh, my fun day. Um, and we had a lot of fun. Uh, and as you look back on the season, we won a lot of baseball games. Uh, we brought a lot of smiles to a lot of fans and did some magical, magical things as a unit. Jamie, I, 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 Jamie I've got one for you. Two yeah. hands, Mac, two hands. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any pop-up, man, that's like a free throw. You know, I work hard to get those pop-ups. I don't want them dropped. <laughs> I loved it. Whenever I used to catch – 
pop-ups with one hand. And so whenever <laughs> there was a pop-up to me, wherever I was at, Jamie come over there screaming, two hands, man, two, two hands. hands. <laughs> and I, I just love it. I just catch it, turn it over and look at it, but laugh. It was hilarious. Yeah. We had a blast. Hey, that's probably in the spring training games too. He was yelling out there. Oh, Everybody, yeah. two hands, two hands. <laughs> that's that's where it all started. It started spring. in spring training. <laughs> really? Spring training. Yep. Oh Fun. God. <laughs> in, in in 2001. And what, what an offense from each row to Mike Cameron to Edgar Martinez to John Oleru to Brett Boone and Jay Buhner and David Bell and, and Carlos Guillen. Edgar Martinez was carving out his Hall of Fame career, Mac. He hit 306 that year. It was his 15th year in the big leagues. He had 26 home runs, 116 RBIs. What was it like for you to watch Edgar hit every day? And do you have an Edgar story? I, oh, I've got a ton of Edgar stories. Uh it was, it was a, a blessing for me to be able to play with him. I played against him for years and saw how good he was, was, but I really couldn't appreciate it until you see what he puts into it each and every day in that batting cage. And I joke with him uh, every now and then. I tell him, I said, man, you've messed up so many hitters in your career. You have no idea because guys would get this thing in their head that, hey, I'm going to try and do what Edgar does and, and, and you know, keep my hands inside the ball and drive it the other way, and I should be able to hit like him. He messed up so many guys. That yeah. <laughs> because nobody good luck, good luck with that. Yeah. I mean, he was just absolutely amazing. Uh, it was great to watch him do his work, and I'm so proud of him for getting to the Hall of Fame because that's absolutely where he belongs. Guys, you were getting closer and closer to the record. The record for wins in a season was set by the 1908 Chicago Cubs, 116 wins. That was Jamie Moyer's rookie year. And, Bingo. Uh, <laughs> Jamie, I used your own joke before we got out of the way. So you're close, not too far away. But anyway, you guys are getting closer and closer. It's game number 161, and you're at 115 wins. Denny Stark starts that ball game. Five pitchers combined on a on a two-hit shutout. You win the ball game one to nothing on a Brett Boone home run. Arthur, you're down there in the bullpen from your vantage point. What was it like to get through? and win that record tie-in and record-setting 116th win, Arthur? Man, to tell you the truth, it was sitting in the bullpen, looking at the game. We down. I said, man, I just I, – I think – did I go in and pitch? No. No, I said, I didn't pitch, but I think, I think I was sitting there. I said, we need to win this game. If we tie it up or we – or do something, I want to go in the game and get this 116. But – since I didn't pitch that night, but we still won with Brett Boone home run or something. But yeah. winning 116 games, man, that's a, that's a lot of wins. And sitting out in that bullpen, watching them guys play them butts off and watching all the guys in the bullpen working their tails off and want to get this 116, man, it was awesome. Before that, uh, guys, we got to talk about really one of the saddest days in the history of our country, uh, September the 11th of 2001, we awoke to the horrific news that two planes had crashed into the World Trade Center towers in New York. One plane crashed into the Pentagon in Washington, and then one plane that was headed to either the Capitol or the White House crashed in a field in Pennsylvania. I still get goosebumps thinking about it. We're in Anaheim getting ready to play the Angels that night. Uh, Mark, we'll start off with you. What do you remember about that morning, September the 11th of 2001? Uh, man, that was such a, a, a sad day. Uh, my wife called me and woke me up, and all she said was turn on the TV. She was back, uh, back here in Texas, so she was a couple of hours ahead. And uh, I turned the TV on, and I, I couldn't believe my eyes. I could not believe what was yeah. going on. And I woke up just in time. Uh, unfortunately, to see the second plane uh, hit the towers. And it, it, it was like a movie. I said, this cannot yeah. be real. This can't be happening right now. And, you know, we didn't know what was going on at the time. We didn't know what was coming next. Uh, nobody knew. So I think that was a, a, a real big uh, determining factor for everybody, just not knowing what was going on, what's coming next, what do we do, how do we do it, just, you know. And I think everybody's minds went to their families for sure. Yeah. Uh, where everybody's families were, whether they were in Seattle or somewhere else, 
Are they okay? What yeah. do we need to do? Can we get home? Can we get to them? Because I know that was my thought, and I know there were other guys wanting to get back to Seattle and get back to their families as well. So just a uh, one of those days that you will always know where you were and what you were doing when that happened. Yeah, Dave Niehaus woke me with a phone call and started yelling, turn on the TV set. I said, what station? He said, any station. And then we watched as that second plane hit the tower and had no idea what was going on. Arthur and Jamie, what do you remember about uh, September the 11th? Man, I was, uh, I just woke up with the kids when I, in the hotel and uh, and I woke up and I uh, caught the end of the plane going through it. It was like, man, is this for real? Because I just woke up and like glazed my eyes. I said, wow, man, this, this is not for real. But showed it again. It was for real. It was sad, man. I, it was just like I had a broken heart, man. It was just like yeah. this, this shouldn't happen. It this this shouldn't happen to our country. But it was like we got we have to do something with something and just pray for all them people, man, and pray for everybody in New York and pray for everybody everywhere else. And it was just a sad sad day, man. Jamie, your your thoughts about that day and how in the world did you guys get through that week? Yeah, I, I know, uh, you know, I echo both of uh, Arthur's and Max's sentiments. You know, I, we were all dead asleep, all in Anaheim. You know, it's kind of a foreign place, but it isn't a foreign place. You know, you're in a hotel, which, you know, that's basically how we live for six months, half of the season in a hotel. And, you know, you wake up to this uh, horrific news and you do flip the TV on. You see what's going on. You're, you know, you're concerned about what's happening in New York. You're concerned about what's happening with your family, wherever that, you know, your immediate family, wherever they are, your extended family, wherever they might be, uh, your friends and, you know, everything going on. It's kind of chaotic and your mind's kind of yeah. all over the place. You don't know what, who to call, yeah. who not to call, when to call, you know, and, and really as players, we were stuck, you know, I'm, I'm my first thought is, oh, I'm going to get on a plane and fly home. Right. And then, you know, it's like, well, wait, let's call the traveling secretary. Let's see what's going on. You know, fortunately, the Mariners were able to, you know, keep us all together, get us on a plane, get us back home, you know, and, and try to create some semblance of I, I hate to use the word normalcy, but just, hey, we're all going to be OK. Let's stay together. Let's think together. Let's make good decisions together and we'll get through this. And, you know, we did as a unit, we did as uh, an organization, we did as a community, and we did as a country. And, you know, it, you know we, we saw that unity that we needed to have as a country. And I think it was really important for us to, you know, to deal with this, these tragedies, uh, try to find a, a silver lining in them. And, you know, eventually we were able to get back and play baseball and hopefully help that uh, that healing process for everybody exactly what a such a difficult and, and sad time you you guys come back one week later and it was just a few days or day or two after that you shut out uh, the angels and you clinched the american league west out at uh, t-mobile park now and mark you and mike cameron <clears throat> took the american flag i don't know where you got it but you had an american flag and everybody was circled around the mound and you celebrated a uh, division title in the most respectful way I've ever seen in my life. Can you describe what that moment was like for you, for Arthur, for Jamie and your team and what that moment meant to us as well? Well, for me personally, I was probably the proudest moment uh, of my career because it wasn't about us, you know, winning 116 games or clinching the division and, and going on to postseason. That was a moment for the country and for the world. Uh, we didn't really know it at the time, uh, but that's what it ended up being. And for us as a, as a team, as a unit that like Jamie was talking about, we met before the game and said, hey, whenever it is that we clinch, if it's tonight, tomorrow, whenever, we need to do this respectfully and we need to share it with the fans. So there wasn't going to be any, you know, popping champagne bottles and none of that stuff going on in, in the clubhouse. And we all just stayed out on the field. I don't remember if we talked about, you know, a flag coming out. Uh, but we saw it coming up, uh, you know, out of the dugout and, you know, guys, everybody touched it, got, got a chance to hold it. And then for whatever reason, it got to me. And uh, some of the guys, I believe Edgar was Edgar and Bone were pushed me out and said, just, Hey, let's just walk around the field. It wasn't something that was really rehearsed. We didn't know that, Hey, we were going to, 
you know, make that loop around the field and then, you know, come to the mound. Uh, it just, it just happened. But for me, it was, uh, you know, the highlight of my career is no question. Yeah. That's what was so beautiful about it was the oh, fact yeah. that, it, that it wasn't rehearsed Arthur, that you guys just went out there and 46,000 fans out of T-Mobile park, you know, she shared that moment with you. Yeah. We just shared it. We just shared it with the fans, man. And shared it with everybody else. If they're watching TV, man, that was, that was that day is just share with the fans and share with the, with the families too. And just, and it was just a sad day and a sad moment. And then you were able to move on from there. You kept on winning and ended up uh, setting the record with the 116 wins. I've got to ask you, you know, you guys really set the town, you know, a, a blaze with, with that year. You know, we had the all-star game that year, which all you guys, I think, should have been on the all-star team. But eight <laughs> Mariner all-stars were on that ball club. What was it like for you to see eight of your teammates in July of that year uh, being the game, Freddie Garcia ends up getting the win in relief. Kazu got a save, and Cal Ripken Jr. in his final All Star game hits a home run off a of Chan Ho Park. And uh, you know what a great moment for Seattle and the American League wins the ball game. Point one. What was it like for you guys to see eight teammates and Lupinell as well be a part of the American League All Star team? Well, I, well I, for me personally, it was it was very deserving uh, for those eight gentlemen to make that All Star team, and for Lou to be the manager of that club. And, you know, it, it is it is an honor. You know, I, I think, you know, when you play as a team and and guys get accolades, it's just a reflection of not only, you know, the efforts that they're giving, but it's the effort of the team as well. So, you know, to be able to host it and, uh, you know, to have eight players there and your manager represented and the organization represented in, in a great way, um, it was just a, it was a, it was a special all star game. How about yeah, you? Yeah, there's no question. I mean, uh, still a, a basically new ballpark, having the all-star game. You've got eight guys on the team uh, and your manager, your local manager managing that ball yeah. club. That doesn't happen too often. So it was great for the city of Seattle. Uh, I know I was pumped about all the guys being uh, being on that all-star team because we had that's what we had. We actually could have played the National League and probably beat them. But, uh, yeah, it was, I was thinking that, but I wasn't yeah. going to say it. Oh, I'll yes. say it. I will say it. I do not care. That, and, and really, that was the thought of that team, that we could beat anybody, right. period. It didn't matter. So yeah. uh, it was great seeing all those guys in the All-Star game and then to get the All-Star game and play well and win. Exactly. Uh, 45, 46,000 fans every night. Arthur, what was it like coming out of the bullpen? Jamie, for you before the game, Arthur during the game, and Mac during the game before playing before 46,000 fans. Tell the truth, it was awesome playing to 46,000 fans every night. I like everybody. Come on, Rose, Chad and Rose and the A-Train, or where's your earrings? Oh, man. But it was it was great, man. Them fans, them fans enjoyed every day of the ball game. Batting practice, you go out there. I was throwing 100 balls up in the stands every day in batting practice. I think that's how I kept my arm loose. <laughs> but uh, just keeping the fans happy. And, man, it's just – the fans was just just uh, like family to us. And I think we went out there and did a great job for the fans. All right. Talking about the fans, let's let's get to the fans and some questions uh, from them. From Jamie Moyer and Mark McLemore, better known as Slim Shady and Arthur Lee Rhodes. Uh, <laughs> let's say <dip>. Arthur. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes. You know, there's the, the diamond earrings. You come into the playoffs and Omar Vizquel can't see with Cleveland because they're so bright. Uh, do you still have your earrings from Carla? Yes, I still have my earrings. They are at home. <laughs> <laughs> Where? What, what happened? You And you got thrown out of the game, right? You never threw a pitch when you came in. You were so Yeah, mad. I got thrown out of the game. Because I, came, I come in a game, said, I, guess, I forgot who the home, home play was. And uh, I said, okay, so can I get my eight warm-up pitches? So after I got my eight warm-up pitches, I told him, I said, on the second pitch, I'm going to hit you right in your ear hole. <laughs> you didn't hurt me. And so Tim McCullough said, you out of the game. Oh. And I waited, Lou, I waited for Lou to come out there. He said, why Why did you kicked out of the game? Because Tim McCullough said he was going to hit him in his ear hole. And I, I was. I, I wanted to go – Second pitch, it was in your ear. Don't tell me to take my earrings out. I had them in the whole year. The whole year, some some little uh, some little guy going to tell me to take my earrings out. That's not right. <laughs> what a great question. But Carla, oh, let's, wow. 
let's go <laughs> back to our fans. Let's see if we have another question for each and every one of you guys. Uh, we want to load up another question here. That's that's a beauty right there about the airing story. And uh, this is from Frank. Mark, how did you handle switching from being an everyday second baseman to, oh my goodness, he said it. Uh, like, Frank, I have no idea player. because I was never a utility player. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I still haven't done that. Yeah. <laughs> But if the question really was, how did I adjust to playing different positions every day? Um, I just did it. My thing was, I, I had a player tell me, a player that I looked up to, uh, Tony Phillips, tell me, uh, Matt, it doesn't matter where you play. All you need to do is get to the plate four or five times a night, and that's it. If they say third base, go out there. They say center field, go out there. That's how Tony Phillips used to talk. So <laughs> well, I thought you were doing <laughs> Dave Stewart. <laughs> uh, no. Tony was a little bit higher than, than Stu, especially when he got excited, which Tony Phillips was always excited. But, yeah. and, and, you know, so that was early in my career. Uh, and back then, utility players were just that. They were guys that played yeah. once, maybe twice a week. Yeah. And uh, I'm sure you guys remember this. They were sometimes referred to as NFL players meaning they would play on Sunday, a yeah. Sunday day game to give the regular guy a night off. And that was not me. So uh, that's why I've always really not liked that tag uh, yeah. because Lou <laughs> used me like no other manager had ever done before playing me in multiple spots. Yeah. Uh, and he was very comfortable with me anywhere. So he didn't have to worry about me and he didn't have to worry about anybody really on those teams. It was just go out there and get it done. So I enjoyed the challenge, especially being at that advanced age, although Jamie was, more advanced than I was. Uh, it was fun. <laughs> well, I tell you what, you know, I talked about you quite a bit in 2019 because Dylan Moore was so good at playing a different position. So I always brought up the best ever at doing this job, which is very difficult, was Mark McLemore in 2001. And he went, Mark McLemore? I said, yeah, you know, you're doing what Mark McLemore did in, in 2001. This kid has so much talent. Let's go back to some more questions from the fans. We've had two good ones uh, right there. Let's see if we can pop up another question. Otherwise, I'm going to keep firing away because this is a blast, guys. I'm, I'm having so much fun with you guys right now talking about that magical run. Do we have another question for Arthur Rhodes or Jamie Moyer? Uh -oh. Rick, or I'm curious if that's your uh, grocery store list on your refrigerator. <laughs> uh, as a matter of fact it is <laughs> yeah yeah okay. i got my grandkids up there so uh what do we need yeah. to get at the grocery store I'll, I'll go pick it up for you and drop it off all right i need some tomato paste tomato sauce some crushed tomatoes uh, so i can make my mom's <laughs> spaghetti sauce oh you guys, nice. you guys are all <laughs> invited man we'll get some meatballs any more questions from the fans otherwise we're going to keep going here all right. Uh, I'll tell you what, uh, Jamie, uh, it, it was so remarkable, that run. Can you guys, do you have a favorite story? I was talking with Arthur a little while ago. Do you have a favorite story from 2001 that really kind of told a story about what you guys were able to do that year and, and, and how you did it? Mac or man, or I'll, I'll tell you for me, there's so many stories, uh, not only from uh, that year, but my four years there, it was just incredible. It was, it was a great, a great experience for me. Um, but man, there's so many stories because we were, we were a family. We weren't just a team. We were a family. We all spent time with everybody. Normally it's pitchers and pitchers and, you know, infielders and outfielders that get segregated like that throughout the course of the season. Uh, but for, for that team, it was just everybody. It didn't matter uh, whether it was a cab ride to the ballpark, a cab ride from the airport. Uh, it, it just did not matter. Uh, dinner out on, on a weekend, it didn't matter what it was. It was just everybody, uh, all of us together all the time. So it was, it was magical. Uh, you know, another thing I, I really remember – how the fans really embraced us. I mean, it was it was nothing like I'd ever seen before. I mean, you hear about the stories of, you know, Chicago having great fans, the Philly fans, Yankees, and, and places like that. 
I will put our Seattle fans up there with any city at any time. It was just, it was a magical time for me in my career. Yeah, you guys outdrew everybody in baseball that year. 3.5 million fans and I had a little burb up here in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was amazing. Uh, Arthur, uh, pretty much probably the same thing that Mac just said. You guys, oh, yeah. How much fun did, did you guys have? off the field together because you were a family on the field. Off the field, man, it was oh. great, man. Cuz uh like you like Max said, we always off the field, we always meet up some like Jamie will call or Mac will call or everybody called each other because they want cuz there was a lot of kids on that team. So, <laughs> it started with Moya first, what he have four or five of them. Then with the <laughs> <Dan> Wilson, <laughs> <laughs> and uh it was just like it was just like like mike said we was all family and everybody got together man it was it was great jamie we got a question here from uh karen what words of wisdom do you have for young pitchers coming up have fun learn how to yeah. throw strikes have fun enjoy the game you know it, it, that, that's what brings you back you know you learn the game you play a lot of positions if you're, if you're left-handed, play catcher, play shortstop, play third base, play the outfield pitch. Mm-hmm. Learn learn all the positions as a young kid. Obviously, being if you're left-handed, you're not going to play those positions when you get older, but you'll understand what it's like to play those positions. And by playing a, a lot of different positions, you'll learn you know positions that you like versus positions that you may not as you or positions that you might be better at. So, yeah. you know, to me, but ultimately you got to have fun in the game. You got to learn the game. I tell people all the time, I'm down here helping a college right now. And I'm telling these kids, if you learn one thing, think about how many times you've been to the ballpark in your life for practice or games. If you learn thing, one thing, every time you go to the field and you learn it well, you're going to learn a great deal about the game of baseball. Where if you're trying to learn four and five things, you're never going to learn them, any of them very well. So it's the idea is to learn one thing at a time each day and learn it well. That's that's great advice. We've got uh, we got a prize winner for uh, the questions. Brian Pruitt is going to be our prize winner uh, today with uh, his question for you guys. So we really appreciate uh, the time. And uh, we got one more question uh, for each of you, real quick. Uh, besides winning, you know, 116 games and winning that particular game and getting the playoffs, what was your fondest memory from the 2001 season? Arthur or Mark, Mac? Wow. My fondest memory. I would probably have to go back and say it was a spring training. It was a spring training game. It might have been the first or second game. And uh, it was our first time getting to see Ichiro do his thing. Uh, so this is way before anything else, but I'm sure you've heard the story. Uh, Ichiro's yeah. first time up, he got jammed and fired a ball into our dugout on the third base side, <laughs> cleared everybody out, who's yeah. jumping and flying, and next pitch got jammed again. I think he got, ended up getting out or whatever and didn't have a particularly good, you know, couple of at-bats that game. And Lou told him, uh, you know, after the game, before he took him out, he said, son, I don't know what you do over in Japan, but over here, you got to be able to pull the ball in the big leagues over here. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we're all we're all just like, oh, man, give him a break. It's the first day. But we also know that this is Lou. So, yeah. we, you know, it was like no big deal. So the next game, Ichiro comes out first at bat, hits a home run to right. Yeah. We're like, okay, he can pull the ball. He's got some pop. Next at bat, another home run to right. And we're looking at Lou. Lou's looking in the dugout at everybody. Ichiro comes around, starts coming down the dugout. Everybody's giving him a high five. And Lou said, son, you're done for the day. That was it. <laughs> I'm going to pull the, ball, pull the ball. Get out of here. You're good. It was hilarious. We just, I mean, we had a blast on that. But there's so many stories like that with uh, Lou, with everybody, uh, from Ichiro to Cam uh to whoever he had so much uh so much respect from all the players um man love that guy to death had a blast there oh my gosh i was not i was not a field one when lou was going where's where's ted hyde where's ted hyde ted hyde was the interpreter for each release 
tell 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 Ichiro to pull the ball one time, pull the ball. Then Ichiro, after hitting that home run, Mac, you guys can confirm this. Said, "Lou, we good? We okay?" <laughs> <laughs> I don't doubt it. Uh, what was he like as a teammate, Jamie? You know, Mac? Ichiro was, was very quiet. Uh, I know for me, I, I I saw him as a very quiet guy. He let uh, you know he let his actions on the field speak for himself. Very prepared, a very prepared player. Yeah. Um, you know, and we all know you know we used to see him stretch, and you you know you want you'd want to go to the store and get that little Gumby figure that you know that would bend and twist all over because he would put his body in positions that you know I didn't know bodies could move to. But uh, you know he he was a very quiet guy, but he always knew like we had a lot of fun on the bus going to and from the airport. Um, and Mike Cameron was kind of our ringleader with that. And, uh, you know, there was, Ichiro could come up with some pretty good comments, uh, on the bus. And we just had a lot of fun. And, you know, I think it really allowed Ichiro to feel comfortable, uh, you know, coming to a, a new country and to major league baseball and, you know, fitting in is important and he fit right in. Um, uh, but you know, his skill sets, I think spoke for themselves. Um, you know, golly, he threw the ball well, he ran well, he put the bat on the ball, he could hit for power if he wanted to, but that wasn't his forte. Um, you know, and he's just a, he was, a, he's a likable guy. Um, and he was a great addition to our ball club. Oh yeah. How often do you guys think back to that 2001 season and what, what you're able to accomplish, Arthur? Man, I'm. I look at I look at it all. I look back all the time because the times I went in the game, um, the times I'm coming in for Jamie Moyer, the times I'm talking to Mike Lamore on the mound. Come on now, let's get these guys out. Time to uh, send Lou. Come on, give me the ball. All right, you got hitters. You got three hitters. Let's go. And but all that time, man, it was great, man. Just playing with awesome, awesome, awesome guys on that team and. And but like like Moya say, bus rides, plane rides, clubhouse. I'm saying we we had a blast in the clubhouse, man. We did everything in that clubhouse, but nobody know what we did in that clubhouse. <laughs> Kevin to myself. So, but like you say, when, when we stepped on that field with 20 and white lines, we was ready. We was we was ready to beat everybody, man. It, we just took it one game at a time. You had fun in the clubhouse. You took it right out of the field. Oh yeah, that's how we do it. Yeah. Mac, uh, there's a really interesting jersey right behind you. You got your jersey there, and it's autographs on it. Can you tell us what's uh, what's behind you? I've, I've got my shopping list. What do you got behind you? That is uh, from 2001, no question about oh. it. So all my family right there signed it back in that jersey. Had to have it. Had to have it. I mean, that's history right there. It was uh, so much fun uh, getting that and, and being with the guys and just going through it. That season – I don't know that it, it'd be, you know, duplicated at some point, maybe. But for us, it was it was one of those things that was never a thought in our mind going into the season. And, it, and even as we got closer to it, it didn't phase us. We didn't try, you know, we didn't try too hard. We didn't play too hard, try to do too much. We just continued with our steady pace of going out. And it started with the pitching. Our starters did their jobs. Uh, that bullpen came in and got it done. And, and speaking from the offensive side, For us, what we knew, if we had a lead in the sixth inning, that meant our starter did their job, and typically they Mm -hmm. were going to go seven, but we knew our bullpen was going to come in and close it out whenever that was. We knew that, and that's what we we, uh, went out there for. But you don't really get that feeling unless you trust one another uh, and you spend time with one another, which we did all of that. We had a ton of fun, but like Art said, when we got between those lines, it was business, and everybody yeah. on that club knew exactly what they needed to do, uh, how to be ready each and every day for a 7 o'clock game, a 1 o'clock game, whatever time we played. Everybody knew what they needed to do in, in order to help that team uh, win games. So it was just a blast, and I got them right there forever. Wow, that's a great uh, souvenir. Guys, uh, Jamie and Arthur, do you have anything special from that 2001 season in your trophy case? Well, uh, tell you, go ahead, Jim. Go ahead, Arthur. I, all my all my stuff is put up in uh, Crawford, Texas, in my movie theater room. But right now, I'm sitting in my truck 
at uh, at Bush's Chicken at the wife's store. She got she told me to come <laughs> sit in the truck and do your interview. And so, but uh, next time I do one, I'll be at the house and I show the my uh, jerseys. <laughs> awesome. Hey, bro, it, it's good to know yeah. that you're still listening to the boss and taking orders. That's a good thing. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Jamie, anything special from that 2001 season in your trophy case? I, you know, I, I, I after the fact, um, I actually got the pitching rubber. Uh, really? I have, I have the pitching nice. rubber at home, you know, and that, uh, you know, I have that in my home and I see it every day. And knowing that, you know, not only myself, but a lot of other talented pitchers pitched on that mount, on that using that rubber. Uh, but it brings back nothing but great memories. Wow. Um, you know, and it's just, you know, it's it's my little memento. Uh, but, you know, I look at that season and look, we've all played. We all had the good fortune to play Major League Baseball. We all had pretty long careers. And, you know, we played on some some good teams and we played on some not so good teams. But knowing that, you know, looking back to that 2001 season, you know, how magical it was for us as players and respecting and appreciating the effort that was given to create those results. Yeah. It's just, it's mind boggling. It's just absolutely mind boggling to think about that. And, yeah. and, and to me, it's was such a special, special group and a special time in all of our careers, regardless if you're a young guy uh, a middle, you know, middle of the career guy or an end of a career guy, you know, it's just, it's all something we all can really just respect, appreciate and hang our hats on. And, you know, it, it's all, you know, winning the world series is great being in with the Phillies in 2008, but you know what, this 116 win team, you know, it was unbelievably, unbelievably magical. And it's not just the record. It's just, how we did it as a yeah. team, how we did it as a group is what makes it so special for me. I'll tell you what, uh, this is this has been a blast. We could go on for hours talking about that magical season. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. And uh, But you created one of the greatest moments that I can remember in my career and for thousands and millions of fans up here in the Pacific Northwest. I can't thank you guys enough for for joining us uh, on this show and reliving uh, one of the greatest years in the history, not only the Mariners, but in the history of Major League Baseball. Arthur Lee Rhodes, Mark McLemore, Jamie Moyer, thank you so much, buddy. I appreciate it, it Rizzy. Hey, you thank you. Them, buddy. Have a great day. All right. All right. Good to see Looking you guys. Y'all take it easy. 2021, MLB. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Mac. Mac, I'll be calling you soon. And more All right. I'm waiting for you to come. Easy, brother. Nice uh, seeing you. I'm waiting for you. All right. Great seeing you. <laughs> Take care. Oh, All right. man. All right. Y'all take it easy. I'll see you in uh, fantasy camp again. Okay. I'll be there. I'll be there. <laughs> Arthur Lee Rhodes, Mark McLemore, Jamie Moore, three of the guys that, that, that played a vital role in one of the greatest years ever in the history of the game of baseball. Coming up at uh, 2 o'clock, we're going to have a media session with uh, – Mitch Hanniger, great to see this kid coming back uh, on all of our Mariners social media channels. Uh, he's healthy. He's coming back this year. 7 o'clock tonight, we're going to have a roundtable on YouTube with Tom Lampkin, Brett Boone, Norm Charlton, and Aaron Seeley talking more about this incredible 2001 season. And also later on tonight, uh, we're going to have the creative cocktails with the one and only Bobby G. So that's going to be fun. You can visit Mariners.com slash Baseball Bash for more information. That was amazing, visiting with three of the guys who played such a huge role in one of the greatest seasons ever in baseball. Again, our thanks to Jamie Moyer, Mark McLemore, and Arthur Lee Rhodes. I'm Rick Riz saying so long, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. See you guys. Thank you for watching today's virtual clubhouse chat. For more information on more great events coming up, visit Mariners.com slash baseball bash.